morning, good morning and a happy Sabbath. Good morning and a happy Sabbath. It is a joy to be in the presence of God and uh, we want to thank you for an opportunity to come and fellowship with us and praise the Lord together. And those who are watching online, we thank you for finding time to log in and watch online and be with us in our worship today. I am excited because we are here by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Though the week may have been difficult, but we are here, we're still alive, and we give God praise and glory and honor to him. And so we have a reason to be grateful. We have a reason to be grateful that we are in the house of the Lord. I want to say thank you for those who are visiting with us and worshiping with us for the first time. You are very welcome. This is um, uh, your church. You are very welcome to come anytime and visit with us, please. As I say, this is one segment that is important. The next segment that is actually important too is that we are able to meet and fellowship together. So when we finish the service, don't run away, please. We want to say welcome and we want to know who you are. We want to fellowship more. So today we have potluck. So you're welcome to share with us not only the communion service, but you share food. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for coming here today. We want to take a moment into the Word of God and uh, reflect a few passages here together um, before we get into our communion service. Bible today will send our thoughts in the book of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Let's pray. Our Father who is in heaven, here we are to worship you today. Lord, we want to take a moment to read your word, and I know without the power of your Holy Spirit, these words will be empty, O oh God. So I pray, Father, that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit, who knows how to interpret the word, may it make it relevant to us, O oh God. Allow me to be a mouthpiece in your hand, O oh God, if there is anything within me, within ourselves, that will be a hindrance in our worship today. We pray for forgiveness. Lord, cover us with your precious blood of Jesus. Tune our mind so that we can center and hear you speak to us. Father, we invite your presence now. Lord, take over and take church. May you be glorified, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the passage for today is Genesis chapter 3. And I have titled my message, Uncommon Grace. Because if you read Genesis 3, the Bible is talking about the fall of man. It is sometimes not easy to see the grace of God when man has already sinned and God says, you know what, it is time for you to leave. Now, it is not common for us to see the grace of God, but in that moment of failure, you will understand that it's still God is gracious. This is the beauty of God. That even in the midst of our own failures, we still find God who is not only loving, but gracious towards us. Last time I spoke here and I said, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, then the Bible says they heard the voice of God. When they heard, they hid themselves. And the first question that God asks after the fall was, where are you? The first question after Adam has failed, it is God who is looking for his people. God who is in search for us. We always think that we present ourselves and carry ourselves before the Lord. That we, our own works and, you know, ways that we can come before the Lord and please Him. But even in the midst of fall, the first question that God asks is to come 
and seek us from where we are, our hiding place. That is grace. That's the love of God. But God has never stopped seeking you and seeking me. So as, as, as we come to the passage here, you know, I have heard many people who talk about God in two different extremes. You know, some say that God is gracious that he overlooks our sin. You know, and those who speak so, they pride themselves on the tolerance and acceptance of everyone. No matter how terrible they are seen, they usually say, let him who without sin be the first one to cast the stone. And you will hear them say, oh, don't be, judge, don't be judgmental. Don't judge. You know, for them, is God is gracious and overlooks our sin. And so, don't tell me about what I have done. God welcomes everyone. That is true. God welcomes everyone. But also, God is a God of judgment. Oh, you know, there are folks who also are very stern in the judgment of God. And, 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 and their, their, their concept of God is, they will say, prepare to meet the judgment of God. They, 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 you know, they, they, they are kind of this mindset. And, I, you know, growing up, probably I had almost the same mindset that God is like a policeman who is waiting when you do something wrong you know, like when you're driving down the road, you're over speeding. You know, those police, you know where they're waiting and they hide themselves. Where there are speed cameras and, you know, they're waiting that any moment they see 75 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, you're going 80 miles an hour. Here you get a ticket. I don't know about you, but there are times that I think actually they really want to get tickets and finish whatever they have. I don't know, maybe they're given assignments that you need to give 100 tickets a month or something. But there are times that you really, they are looking for you, even without doing anything really major. They are there waiting for you to make a mistake, and here you are, ticket. And sometimes that is the view of God. God who is there waiting for you to do one wrong thing, and then, bam! Some of us this morning, we are even guilty and say, you know what, God, and sometimes, even on a Sabbath, have you done something and something happens to you? And you start saying, you know what, I shouldn't have been, I knew very well it was Sabbath, I needed to be in church, but, but I decided to do this, and oh my goodness, I think God is actually punishing me for avoiding to go to church and doing this. Let me tell you, sometimes it is true, yes, we pay for our sins, but sometimes it's not. God is not just waiting for you. One mistake, and the, your name is canceled from the book of life. That's not how God works. So we have two extremes on how sometimes we relate to God. We have the extreme that says everything goes. You know, come as you are. You know, don't tell me judgment, whatever. Don't, you know, if you are, you know, telling me something, don't correct me because you are also a sinner. I'm a sinner, so we are together. So you are not perfect, I'm not perfect. So yes, you know, don't, don't be here lecturing me, telling me what I need or I need not to do. But the word of God is clear. When something is wrong, it's wrong. It is our responsibility to speak when something is wrong. I spoke about Genesis when Adam and Eve, they sinned. Remember what I say? The Bible says that Eve took the fruit and gave it to Adam who was with him. Adam was standing right there with Eve, and he spoke nothing. God had given him instructions about what needed to be done. Remember, and this is why, you know, allow me, because I think Father's Day is coming here. So let me, let me, let me also just uh, put a little bit of the Father's Day thing here. Because you can... You can follow culture, you can follow fashion, you can follow whatever you want. But as a child of God, the Bible is our standard. The Bible says that when Adam and Eve, when Eve took the fruit, remember the first time, 
When God gave instructions, Eve was not there. He gave it to who? To Adam. So technically, it is Adam who passed the knowledge of what God has spoken to Eve about their requirement of what was needed in the Garden of Eden. Now, I don't know, but you know very well that sometimes men are not very good at giving instructions. But I don't know that's what happened when he told Eve about what was needed until Eve didn't take it rightly. But, but I, also, <laughs> I also think to myself that, that, that when Adam had received the instructions from God, he passed them over to Eve. That was orderliness. God said, pass it here, pass it to Eve, and then tell her of what God required them to do. The question comes, when Eve was busy listening to the devil, when he was busy listening to the enemy, and Adam was standing right beside Eve, hearing all the narrative, and he said nothing. Now I ask myself, why did Adam not say something? Was it just curiosity saying, yeah, let's see this thing. How is it going? It sounds very nice. You know, it's, the devil sounds very convincing. Because what the devil told Eve, he was really putting doubt in the mind of Eve that there was something more that God had withheld from them that was better than God. And when he put doubt in the mind of Eve, Sin started coming in. When God looks bad, sins look good. And so when, when the thought that in the mind of Eve that God was withholding something that was greater for them to enjoy, when that thought entered into the heart of Eve and started doubting about the word of God, temptation was knocking at the door. Seen at the core of it is doubting the goodness and the word of God. Oh, will you tell me that, you know, Pastor, you know, how, how is that applying today? It's the same way. Many of us, we think there is something better outside God. But, but let me tell you, ask people who have gone out. Maybe some of us, we have been there. We used to be there. We used to hang out. We used to have fun. We used to drink. We used to do whatever we can. But finally, you recognize that no matter how fun it may be outside there, there remains an emptiness in your heart that is always aching for something better. That something better is the presence of God. There is nothing good outside God. So how could it be better for us to be able to say, God, this is your word. I may not understand it, but I know that in the end it is for my own good. So I will obey the Lord irrespective of whether I understand it or not. Could it be true when God says, our giving? Many of us, we say, you know what? God says, give and shall give it unto you. Some of us, we debate when it comes to putting God first. You see the paycheck, and I've realized this. The more money you earn, the harder it becomes for you to give. When, when you are only getting $1,000, you are very faithful. When you are getting 500 you remove 50 When you are getting 200 you remove 20 when, But then the 2000 started coming in, 3000 started coming, 4000 5000 When it starts getting 6000 you say, this is a lot of money, Lord. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> help me. Because now there is something that makes your heart even harder for you to put God first. But in the end, I'll say this. The same temptation in Eden of thinking that something is better outside God is the same battle that we struggle today. Doubt about the goodness of God. So Adam, without believing God, took the fruit and ate it. The point I was saying here for Men's Day is this. Most of our problems arise when men who know what is right, they keep quiet. 
Let me tell you. Those who are here and you have families, there's one thing that you can agree with me. If there is something that we like to do as men, is that when there's problems, let me tell you what you want to do. Just keep quiet. When there's something going on, there is that urge of a man. You know, you know some, of, <laughs> some, of, some of you say, Pastor, I just want peace. <laughs> so, but you cannot look for peace when things are wrong. And hide behind the cave. You know, there's man's cave where we go into our own nothing box. They say nothing box. Where you don't want to say anything. I think that the challenge we have, even in nowadays, is that we have men who are silent in the face of evil. I don't know whether men are silent or men have been silenced. Well, maybe that's another time. But, 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 but let me say, we, 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 we are in that place that, that the one, when, when we ought to be able to speak about what is not right, God has given responsibility for men to be in the presence of God, hear what God says, so that they can bring the message and guide their family in the principle of godliness. Now the problem comes when sin entered and the curse came. The Bible says that the woman should desire to have the man, but the man will rule over them. God does not say you rule your wife, but the Bible says you lead your wife. And there is a difference. There is a difference. Well, that would be another sermon. But let me, let me, let me continue saying as, as we come to this place, and, 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 and happy men's day in advance, you know, I think that they don't give us enough credit. So sometimes let's, you know, blow our own trumpet, you know. Happy men, men's day for all the men who are here. Let me tell you, I give you credit, and I speak with all honesty, that, that in most of our churches what we are missing is men who have a heart for God, who are willing to say, I am here and I want to follow God. And the responsibility has been left mostly to the ladies to take care of the children and take care of everything else. But God says, uh-uh, your responsibility, before God created any, the woman come into existence, there was Adam. And he put him in the Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden, Hebrew, it was in the delightful spot. That means God created Adam in the presence of God. When you are in the presence of God, then you are able to communicate the word of God and guide your family in a godly manner. So I'm urging all the men who are here, be in Eden, the presence of God. True men are not men with muscles, are not men who can command authority by saying, this is my way. True manhood is a man who has a heart for God. Who are able to speak what is right and evil. Even when she doesn't listen, you speak the word of God. And when you speak the word of God, you speak it with love. Because the Bible says God created us in the image of our Father who is in heaven. God was never controlling. There's no way you can be controlling. But the Bible says that's what happens. Well, you go and read it. You know, on the other hand, when the fall came, everything else, the Bible says the woman will have a desire. NLT, Bible will say the woman will desire to control the man. But the man will dominate over you, will rule over you. And I think that's where we have the battles even today. You know, most of the battles we have, is the woman who won't control the man in the home and the man who has become authoritarian and giving commands at home. But I want to say what the Bible says, submit doesn't mean you are inferior. It means willingly put yourself under the leadership. That's what the word submission means. Willingly, not coercing, willingly put yourself under the leadership of this godly man, not because you are inferior, but because God has ordained how orderliness comes into the family. 
Our ladies, please read the word of God. So here we come in Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says, you know, Genesis chapter 3 gives us a proper perspective of the view of God. When Adam sinned, God did not strike them dead because his holiness could have required him to do the same. Nor did he say, it is okay that you have sinned. No, as his love could have allowed. No, the picture in Genesis chapter 3 is the picture that is balanced. That balanced whereby grace of God. Also, we have God who says sin has consequences. But God says there is grace. Today, I'm speaking about the uncommon grace of God. Now, let, 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 me, let, me, let me go further by saying that in Genesis chapter 3, we see the Bible says, seeing how it contaminates, you know, us and it requires the cleansing power of God. Now, when we look at Genesis chapter 3, maybe let me go there right now here. The Bible says here, in Genesis chapter 3, you, you, I will not read everything, but let me, let me read from chapter 14. So, the Lord got saved to the serpent. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than all the beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And then he says, 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Right here is what we call the proto-evangelion, which means the gospel starts right here. God who is gracious enough that in the midst of man's failure still comes and gives us a glimpse of what will happen as you study the Bible to the end. And what you study the Bible to the end is Christ who comes. And here is where he's introduced. Even in the midst of failure. Christ is introduced here. How do I know? Well, I know because the Bible starts with saying, I will put an enmity between you and the woman. The devil thought that by speaking to Eve, he could have won Eve towards his side so that Eve could repel against God. But in return, God has changed things. The woman now has enmity with the serpent. In other words, when the serpent is trying to develop friendship, when the serpent is trying to woo the woman so that it can come on his side, God says, uh-uh, you are not going to be friend. I have a plan for this mankind. And I will not sit here and allow the friendship of the enemy to continue. So God says, I will put a enmity between you and the serpent. But also God says, between you and between your seed and her seed. At this particular point, there was no seed that was mentioned. But yet God says, I will put a enmity between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What was he talking about? Study the Bible, you will understand that all through the passages of the Bible, the seed always came from the male. All through the passage of the Bible, there was no seed of the woman except here. All through the seed of the man is what we hear. You know, the seed coming from Abram, the seed coming from Isaac, the all through the passages of the Bible, except this place, the Bible only talks about the seed of the woman. What is he talking about? He's talking about what could come out of the woman. The Bible says that when Jesus was conceived, it was what? The birth was what? A virgin who? Mary. It was not the seed of a man. The birth of Jesus was not the conception of Joseph and Mary. It was the conception of the Holy Spirit, as the Bible tells us. So there was no seed that was coming out of a man. 
But here the Bible is looking ahead of one who will come from the seed of a woman who will be the Messiah. And the Bible says as the Messiah will come, the Bible says he shall bruise your heel and there will be consequences to sin because the Bible says the serpent, because of the sin, Jesus went to the cross and the heel was bruised. But it did not kill. But then the Bible says, he shall bruise your head. That means that very seed will destroy who you are. Christ destroys the enemy. When the enemy comes, he will only do bruises to you. The enemy can only do bruises to you. The enemy cannot kill you. The enemy can only do bruises to you. And it's good news to know that in this world, some of us, we are bruised than others. That is true. We walk wounded, bruised, because that is the consequence of sin. But the good news is that the enemy cannot kill you. If you are a child of God, the only thing that the enemy can do is to inflict bruises. But in the end, that enemy will die because we stayed on the head of the enemy. That's why God gives you authority. When you come in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow and tongue confess that Jesus is God. When you are a child of God, I wish you knew. I wish somebody would, would just say amen. And when you are a child of God, there is nothing. For you to fear. Because the enemy has no power to a child of God. Finally, we will bruise, stape on his head. Because God has given us that mandate. When judgment comes, Christ will declare to the enemy. Christ will say, look, these are the faithful ones. These are them that obey the commandment of the Lord. This is the patience of the saints. Revelation says so. This is the patience of the saints. Them that have overcome by the blood of the Lamb. The Bible continues to say, Yes, the curse comes to the woman Regretly multiply your sorrow and conception. In the pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. And he shall rule over you. That's the communion that was there before has been broken. It's like a mirror. When the mirror was complete, you will see the image. Now the mirror has been broken by sin. We only see the fragments of the image of God. Relationships that have been perfected. Before, there was no fear. There was no guilt. There was no running. There was no hiding. But when sin comes in, we are here running and hiding. And the Bible continues. Come to Adam. Come to verses 20 here. I'm trying to hurry up here. Come to verses 20. The Bible says, And Adam called his wife name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now, I read that passage and I was trying to think. This seems out of place. You know, at first I was like, okay, this is the curse. But then, why is Adam coming in here now and trying to name Eve? And I, I, I had to take time to really think what is the connection between what is before and what has come here. And this statement here is a statement of faith. Let me tell you why it's a statement of faith. When Adam before, Genesis chapter 2 and coming along, God had promised Adam and Eve, that when if they obey God, they, they will have life and everything was okay. The enemy comes in and he, 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 he puts doubt in the mind of Adam and Eve. Then before, Adam doubts about God's presence. Doubts about the word of God. Doubts about God. But now, when God comes here and has given the curse, but within the curse, there is also grace. Adam listens because when they had sinned, God 
was they knew that the wages of sin is death. There was no life. They knew they were destined. Adam knows the wages of sin is death. We have eaten this and there's no life for us. But then God comes into the scene. And as Adam listens and listens about the seed, then he recognizes again that though we have sinned, still God is gracious, there will be life. We will not be destroyed again. And because of that, the faith of Adam, now he names Eve. He names the woman Eve. You realize that he never named. Eve is not mentioned until this time. Eve means life, you know, the mother of all living. The mother of life. Before, when God created Adam and Eve, and, you know, when, when Adam was singing this poetic music, when he saw, he, saw, he saw Eve, he saw the woman. The Bible says, the woman. That's all it says, ish, in, in Hebrew. Ish, isha. It says, the woman. Woman means out of Man. That's what it means. Woman. Before all this has happened, it was man, Adam, and woman. When the fall comes, Adam recognizes that God has given them another second chance. Uncommon grace. And then he looks at the wife and says, he called her Eve, meaning life, meaning life. Adam recognized that out of the one where sin started from, God in his own mercy again will restore us even through that very one where sin started from. The woman will bring forth the Messiah, the Son of God, who will bring life to us. This was on a personal reflection on myself, and maybe it is a point that for you and for me. Where there was a mess, God in his own wisdom, the very person where evil sin started from, Yet that very same person becomes the conduit where God uses to bring redemption. I, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have found people who can write you off. Sometimes people will look at the mess that has happened before. And sometimes they may look at what is happening and maybe they are looking at you right now. Maybe they are looking at your family. Maybe they are looking at your children. Maybe, I don't know, whatever it is. But I have realized that sometimes when there is evil and there is apparent death, we try to cancel people out and we try to write them off. But, but, but let me tell you, the very same woman we are seeing kind of originated from becomes the same woman where life also is found. And that is what I call grace. The uncommon grace of God that he can take the brokenness of your life and my life. He can take the filthy rags that we bring before God. He can take the sins that we commit. He can take our wretchedness and still change someone. And he becomes and holy man, after God is on heart, if you are doubting me, look at the example of David. A man who was a murderer. A man who was an adulterer. A man who was everything else other than a man of God. But yet, by the grace of God, God was able to transform him. And he becomes a man after his own heart. That tells me there is nothing that God can't be able to do. There is no one that needs to be written off before the presence of God. There is nothing that is difficult before God. Don't write people off. Pray for them. Uplift them in prayer. Hold their hand. Encourage them. Be the Jesus in their life. And you will be surprised. God can take the worst criminal. 
and still become a firebrand for the Lord because he's God. Because he's God. He can take you a mess and make it a message for the world to know. And common grace of God. The next passage, probably where I will conclude here, the Bible says, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord made the tunics of skin and clothed them. Why was God making tunics of skin and clothed them? Why did God have to make tunics and clothe them? Not only God has provided grace to them, <laughs> but God becomes the world's first clothing designer. Here, and he fashions clothing industry, I think, started from here. But, you know, I, I thought about that clothing industry and I thought about it. The really clothing, the Bible says in Genesis, if you read Genesis 2, I think towards the end, maybe 24, 25, you know, when you read the end of 25, the Bible says that Adam, you know, they were both naked, um, man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. They were not ashamed because before sin entered man, man was not self-conscious of himself because we were created, hear me well, we were created to depend on God. We were created to always be dependent on God. Our job was not to reflect glory to ourselves. Our job in creation was to be the image of God. To reflect who? Christ. That's why we call ourselves Christians, which means Christ-like. In other words, your job here is not for me to see you. Your job, if you are a child of God, is not for me to See how much you have acquired in this world. Your job is to live your life in a way that when others see you, they will see what? The image of Christ. So the original intent plan of God was not for man to be self-conscious of himself. Intent original plan was for us to reflect on God. Nothing was self-centered. Everything else was God-centered. We were there to enjoy and reflect the glory of God. But then when sin entered, what did this sin do? All of a sudden, the Bible says, men became conscious because he had the knowledge of good and evil. What that means is that men became like God, as the Bible says. How did man become like God? Man becomes like God. God is self-dependent. God is the one who is self-dependent, knows what is right and what is wrong. It was known the desire of God that men should be experiencing evil. We were created to enjoy the goodness of God and reflect on him. But when sin entered into the world, and this is what I want you to hear to me well. When sin entered into the world, man becomes self-conscious. Now, it is not only about reflecting God. Now, we became conscious of the evil, the good and the bad. And that's why I usually say, if the parents here were raising up your children, do whatever you can to preserve the innocence of your children. Do whatever you can to preserve the innocence of your child. It is the experience of evil that brings a lot of problems. 
Have you ever realized that sometimes in our relationship, what brings problems is not really, is, is, is that experience of evil. Now, you look at your husband, you look at your wife, you look at somebody else, you interpret them through the mind of who you are, through your experience, and sometimes has nothing to do with what they're doing. It has everything to do with you. People, I've said this and I'll repeat it again, people oftentimes don't treat you the way you are. People will treat you the way they are. So that experience, now it comes here and I hear this, uh, you know, <laughs> let me, you hear this pastor, you know, he went to do shopping and he said he was coming at 7 o'clock. I didn't see him at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. I was trying to call him. He, he's not answering the phone. He just, he then he showed up at 10 o'clock in your head. You are like, you know what, I think something is going on. I think something is going on outside there, you know, and here you are, you are burning. Who told you something is going on? But when I look at your life, I realize those are, that's what you used to do. Now your experience is being interpreted and you are looking everything through the eye of something else. Through the eye of something else. Oftentimes what causes a lot of problems in our relationships is our own experiences. That's why we lose trust, we lose everything. Because of different experiences. The less experience, and I say this, not every experience is worth having as a child of God. Protect yourself from some of the experiences. The Bible says here, man becomes self-conscious. Because guilt kicks in because of sin and shame. And guess what happens? Christ comes and he covers because the Bible tells me that Adam, when they heard the presence of God, they started running and started hiding from God. And when they started hiding from God, who told them they were naked? How come this time now they are ashamed? Because what has happened it's not the outside. It's the inside. It's the inside. When guilt kicks in, we try to hide so that we are not caught, we are not seen. Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, one of the hardest things for us is to be vulnerable to one another. To be known for who we really are. Not in our suits. <laughs> not in our holy singing. To be known in the parts and the things that are not right. And sometimes, let me tell you, when you find someone who knows you are wrong and bad side, but still they love you anyway, you have found a true lover. You will never truly say you love someone until you know the dark side of who they are. And we are always running to hide. Hide ourselves. And so Adam and Eve in their clothing themselves with fig leaves. The Bible says fig leaves. And I'm wondering, the fig leaves will fall. You know, how long were they going to cover themselves with, with fig leaves? You know, how are they going to cook with fig leaves? How, how long are they going to stay, you know, dig with fig leaves? I'm trying to imagine, you know, how, how foolish was it, was it? Because the leaves will only cover a small part and within a few days they, they are dry. For how long were they going to cover themselves? How foolish were they to hide before the presence of God? Because God already knew where they were. He saw them. He understood them. So I'm asking myself, what is the point of you covering yourself? He already knows. He already knows. But, 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 but let me tell you, is that not what we do? Is, is that not what we do? In a state of acknowledging our mistakes, our failures, what do we do? We are busy putting the fig leaves within ourselves. 
We put the fig leaves of trying to be religious and trying to be good neighbors, trying to cover ourselves. And Christ comes and says, your way of salvation can never work. Because the way you're trying to cover yourself, sin cannot be hidden. It must be confessed. And there's not just confession. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Jesus comes and says, the first sacrifice for them to have the skin, I believe a lamb was slaughtered. That's the first sacrifice. An innocent lamb. John will say, behold, the lamb of God that taketh away every sin. Jesus himself. There is no remedy for sin with our covering of fig leaves. Some of us, we cover fig leaves with work. Look busy. Look okay. Some of us, is food. Eat as much as you want. Make yourself happy. Some of us, is religious activities. Whichever way we want to do it, there is nothing that can cover us except the Lamb of God and the blood that was shed on the cross. And so, God comes to cover the nakedness. Let me tell you, maybe this is a sight now. God is concerned about your nakedness. I repeat it again. God is concerned about your nakedness. If he wasn't concerned, there was no need of covering. And I've realized here today, nakedness it's a spiritual problem. It's something that is in us. It's not a fashion problem. It's a spiritual problem. That's my own understanding. Why? Anyone who feels the sense of guilt when you are before the presence of God, you feel unworthy. You will feel the effect. You will feel the effect of sin. Remember what the Bible says? The closer you draw to God, what happens? You recognize your unworthiness. You no longer want to be the one who is presenting yourself. You want God, please. I don't even want to appear. Hear what Peter will say, uh-uh. You know, get away. John will speak the same. How can I baptize when Jesus comes and baptizes? He says, uh-uh. I'm not even worthy to fit into your shoes. Not worthy. The closer you get to God, the more you want to hide yourself so that only Christ can be seen. The closer you get to God, the more you realize that your focus is not about you. It's not about how I glorify myself. How I want to look myself. The attention moves from you. The attention moves to God. So everything you do, you start saying, God, please let the focus be not about me. Let the focus be who? The glory of God. I don't want to be seen. I only want Christ to be seen. And the enemy has, you know, changed our concept in our minds in our culture today. And guess what has happened? The enemy has made us to believe that you are a small God, that everything should revolve and center around you. Even something that is supposed to be godly. Guess what we happen? We are the one who wants to put ourselves in the front. And then put a small phrase, see here the beauty of the Lord. Who told you the beauty of the Lord? Is it the beauty of the Lord or we just want to see you? I'm not saying we shouldn't be dressing well. No. God wants you to be modest in whatever you do. God wants you to be looking good. Yes, that's of course. Image sometimes is everything. But I'm saying let it not be done for self-glorification. Let it be done with the mindset. How can God Amen? So don't misquote me here. <laughs> All I'm saying, the closer you move to God, 
you realize that it's not about you. You start realizing, you know what, God, it is all about you. It's not about me. When sin entered, Adam and Eve became so self-conscious. Now they were hiding from God. But God in his own grace comes and provides some nice leather jacket, I believe so, from the skin and covers them properly because he's a God of grace. I want to say here today, the uncommon grace of God. As we take a moment today in our communion service, it is a reminder just like Adam and Eve. Sometimes we run from God. We hide from God. Each one of us, we have been faced with shame and guilt in one way or the other. There is something today that you wish perhaps you didn't say. There's something today that perhaps you wish it couldn't have happened the way it has happened. Each one of us, we understand the gravity of sin. We understand how we are running away from God. But God still is God who is running after us. Salvation is of God, and it has nothing to do with you. You can try your fig leaves, but it's only the blood of Christ that can take away the sins. Two weeks ago, I was talking to one of my friends, you know, in the countryside. He went somewhere there, and he was telling us his little dog, just as a little dog, I don't know whether it's Chihuahua or something. I don't know those names, all of them properly. But it's a little dog. So this little dog, one evening, he couldn't find where the dog was. But in the house, the house was stinky with an awful, awful odor that was in the house. They were trying to find the dog. They were trying to, they couldn't find where the dog was. So the owner started looking and said, what happened? Did something, a rat died or something? You know, what? This is just awful. It's just the smell is awful. So he started following around, going to one bedroom. Eh? No, this, this, the smell is not too much here. Going, so he's, he kind of focused on one area where the stench was so much in the house. Then under one corner where there was a chair, they found that little dog cowled inside there, quiet, not moving at all. They didn't know what had happened. But the story was, this little dog walked outside in the evening. And then, you know, curiosity of the dog saw something running in the compound and decided, you know what? Let me run and chase to see what was happening. So the little dog started chasing that what, something that was in the compound. But it was a skunk. So when the little dog was in, you know what skunks do? <laughs> they say, ah, don't come too close. So the skunk sprayed that whatever, you know, it sprays. I don't know whether you have been sprayed, but I, I haven't I had the experience. But I'm told it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's your car or whatever, it will stink and that thing never goes out. So the little dog, the skunk sprayed to the little dog. The dog was petrified, ran home, scared for what had happened. It went and hid in the corner. But hiding in the corner, the smell gave it away. No matter what it would do, the smell was still there. And I want to say to some of us, it's the same way. No matter what we do, the stench of sin still is there. 
So she told us the only way, and they were advised that the only way to take that thing, you know, you can try as much as you want. You can have soap, you can have Clorox, you can do whatever you can. It doesn't come out. The only way to come out is you have to have tomato juice. That's how what he says, or tomato, whatever. You have to wash it with tomato juice. I have no idea. You work it out. But the only thing that takes that stench away is that tomato juice. Or tomato, whatever it is, is whether smoothie or whatever, but it, tomatoes have to be involved for that stench to come out. So you can imagine what happens. They had to go shopping and bring the whole whatever of tomatoes from, I don't know, you know, Walmart. And instead of the normal water, they had to wash their dough with tomato juice and wash it over and wash it over until the stench could leave. You know, I thought about it. And as I'm thinking here today, the devil has sprayed us with some awful skunk smell. And some of us, we are working here dressed nicely, but that deeply in our hearts. The truth will be told. We are still smelling. The only thing that can wash us is not just the tomato juice, but it's the juice of the blood of Christ. And today God says, I invite you into the communion table so that you can partake the bread and the blood of Christ. I want to invite you. This is an opportunity for you. I don't know where you are, but I want to say use this opportunity as we come to the communion service. Not only to thank God for the gift of life, but to truly ask God, God, remove the stench of sin in my life. Lord, give me victory, whatever it is that we are struggling with. God, I need your power. I need your victory. May the Lord help you as we re-examine ourselves. But let's remember that even in our worst mistake, there is the uncommon grace of God. Let's pray. Father who is in heaven, we thank you for the beauty of the cross and the blood of Christ that is able to save us, O oh God. And even today, Lord, we have been challenged. Perhaps, Lord, we have come like Adam and Eve hiding today, Lord. And you know deep down in our hearts, Father, we need your cleansing power. Father, we need to be clothed with your righteousness. Father, who is in heaven, as we take a moment for communion service today, we invite your presence to be with us, O oh God. Lord, accept our worship, accept our communion, accept our prayers, O oh God, accept our petition, grant us forgiveness, cleanse us, purify our hearts, make us right with you again. Thank you for hearing our prayer. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.